So hi everybody. I hope uh, I hope you're doing well. And uh, what I'm doing today is we're talking about uh, aerial photography, and uh, we're going to be doing some processing. And but first of all, let me just drag this over here. Yeah, make sure you're sharing that screen too. At the bottom, there's a little share button. Ah, there we go. Okay. Sometimes I'm a little Neanderthal when it comes to uh, running webinar software. <laughs> All right, there we go. You guys can see that. Perfect. So, great. Okay, so let me just get started. Um, I'm Colin Smith and uh, founder of Photoshop Cafe. This is me. Um, I don't have a webcam hooked up, so you can kind of just uh, see my face there. I look something like that. Sometimes my hair is uh, better and sometimes it's worse. Um, and uh, essentially, who am I? Uh, founder of Photoshop Cafe. I speak regularly at different conferences. You guys might have seen me at Adobe Max, WPPI, um, Imaging USA, uh, places like that. I'm there regularly. Um, also an ambassador with DJI. So I was actually one of the first DJI experts, um, which is what they call their ambassador program. So um, I do uh, speak for them at different events and things like that as well, different conferences. Um, and also I'm an x right Colorado master. Um, and I've written 20 books. My latest book is on drones. It's actually the photographer's guide to drones with Rocky Nook. I'm a YouTuber. So um, I have 130,000 subs currently right now on the Photoshop Cafe channel. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button right now. <laughs> and, um, and I actually started off in the industry, not as a trainer, but um, as a working professional, which today I still have clients and uh, some of the clients that I've worked with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here. I'm just going to play just a short little video. Just so you can kind of have a look, see what it's like through the eyes of a drone. So um, it's just a few different shots here that I put together. And uh, let me just play that. Okay, so that's just a few shots um, out of the many, many shots I've, I've taken over the years. Um, so I actually started about five years ago, and this is what drones looked like then. Five years doesn't seem like that long, but uh, a lot of things have happened and a lot of things have changed in that time. As you can see back here, I was using a, the latest GoPro, which was the Hero 3, and essentially was just attached to the bottom of the drone, as you can see there on, on a gimbal. That was a two axis gimbal that was right before the three came along. And essentially you couldn't see anything out of the camera or you couldn't really see what the drone was seeing. You just basically flew it and put the camera on either video 
or time lapse if you wanted to take photos because there was no remote control or anything like that of the camera. So you just basically flew around and uh, you took your pictures. And then uh, this is what we did for FPV, which is first person view. You literally had to buy, there was a backup screen for a, uh, for a car. And then um, we literally had to wire these up ourselves. If, and that would actually show a view on that screen of the uh, GoPro. So that was kind of uh, only five years ago. And it seems like, you know, 20 years ago as far as technology. And now, um, you know, this is, well, this is actually a couple of years old, but you know, some of the more current gear, I've got the Inspire 1 Pro there and the Phantom 3 Pro, I'm now flying the Phantom 4. So um, I've got the headphones on, not because I'm, I'm trying to be cool, but that's actually uh, motor racing. So if you've ever shot any motor racing, you'll know you want to put earmuffs on because it's extremely loud. Um, and so my current favorite drone right now, because people always ask me, which drone do you recommend? Which one do you use? And uh, this is the one that's the newest one from DJI. It's the Mavic 2 Pro. Um, and I love this particular one uh, because it's foldable. The arms fold up and it's very portable. So if you want to, uh, you know, go hiking or you want to put this in a backpack, it actually takes up about the size of a lens. And, uh, and it also has a Hasselblad camera on it because uh, DJI now is a part owner of Hasselblad. And, uh, and so this thing is, is great, uh, does good pictures and good video. And you can also see that the uh, controller there on the left side, that folds up and you can just use your iPhone as your FPV. Uh, another one I love is the Phantom 4 Pro. Um, this is another one I fly. It's got just really good uh, quality sensor on it. The camera actually uses a Sony RX100 sensor. So it's really good in low light. Um, can shoot 4K video up to 60 frames per second. And, uh, and it does 20 megapixel images and shoots in RAW in DNG. Um, if you want to get a little more professional, then there's the Inspire. I have the Inspire 1 Pro. Um, these are great. They have a micro four thirds camera on there, interchangeable lenses, um, great for shooting things like motor racing and things like that, where you don't want to get close to the action, but you want to make it look close. So, you know, things like the drag racing and things like that, that I shot, um, I was using that with a longer lens on it. And that way I was able to make it look like I was closer without getting in any danger or flying over any people, which is illegal to fly over people, so you don't want to do that. Um, okay, so let's just quickly, I want to talk about term terminology here. Um, just it uses standard aerial terminology, but it's good to know uh, when we go from side to side, it's called rolling, uh, not banking, but rolling. <laughs> Yawing is rotating, and in pitch is when we're going uh, forwards or backwards. All right, so there's one tip I want to give here um, it's just about the only thing I'm really going to talk about with the drone software. Um, and that's tuning the gimbal. Um, so I don't know if you guys have drones already or you're looking at them. So I want to spend a lot of time here. But one of the things I do like to customize, and you'll find under the advanced settings there, is the gimbal speed and easing. Um, because out of the box, the gimbal rotates uh, or tilts, should I say, very, very quickly. And if you're doing any shots as far as like uh, video, it just, it ruins the shot and the minute you move it because it's just too sensitive. So I like to slow it down a little bit. And in another um, setting to play around with is the pitch smoothness. Now on this screenshot, it says pitch smoothness. It, they changed the name of this um, every, <laughs> I don't know how many times I keep changing the name, but so if that name changes, it's still, um, the setting's still in the same place. And basically what that is, is easing. So when you stop moving, it doesn't just immediately come to a stop, but it slowly uh, will come to a, a halt, kind of like, a, you know, when you play billiards in the ball, rather than just stop, it slowly comes to a, a stop. And it just means when you move that gimbal, you can actually use the shots. Otherwise, if you don't change with these settings, you're just going to lose. It. So we're not really talking about video, though. We're talking about photos. This was actually one of my very first photos with the drone. This is five years ago. And this was actually a still frame from video on a GoPro. And I was at the beach and this pelican just flew underneath me. And, um, and of course I was hooked because I just never seen, uh, you know, a shot like this before or fr from an angle like this, because I'm just standing on the beach. There's no structures above it or anything to be shooting down. So I just want to say, you know, that my love for drones doesn't so much have to do with the fact that I can go, you know, 400 feet up in the air 
what it's about for me is being able to put the camera wherever I want. So a lot of my aerial stuff actually doesn't even look like aerial stuff. Sometimes it looks like I'm just using a regular camera. But the thing is, I can position the drone exactly how I want, get the light where I want, like that sun coming through that tree is not by accident, that's on purpose. And also where it's intersecting with the land. So I'm, I'm able to compose this with altitude to get the reflections coming across the water and just go where I wouldn't be able to go for camera. So it enables me to, you know, set up my shots nicely. Um, you know, shots like this, you just, you couldn't do. I mean, maybe you could take a boat there, but it would be very dangerous with the rocks. Um, and you can just get, you know, just beautiful views of that you just wouldn't normally be able to get or, Oh, they would be very difficult to get. So these are just some different shots that I've done here. And this is nice, you know, doing a, you know, right before sunrise, you know, I don't have to get wet, don't have to grab a boat, just go to the beach, throw the drone out, get the shot. Um, and this one here was actually, um, last year was uh, named by Time Magazine as one of the, I think, 14 most beautiful drone pictures of the year. So I was really honored to receive that. And that was at the Barona Speedway. And then we've got the top down shots, you know, so, you know, you can see the quality of the imaging here and it's just cool to be able to get a shot straight down. This is the undeniable drum shot because there's just no other way to get this kind of shot um, unless you're in a helicopter, perhaps, um, you know, waterfalls some trees. I'm just going to rush through some of these quickly, just showing you some different angles. And in places like this, you know, you go into Hawaii, you know, I'm just standing on the shore there and I'm able to throw my drone up and capture this kind of a panorama and just get a view that you just wouldn't normally see without renting a helicopter and spending a lot of a lot of money and then even then when you get the helicopters there's certain times they can fly they can't fly in certain conditions and things like that uh, here's another example you can never do this in a helicopter getting this low um, and then just making sure you capture some interesting foreground element there um, so I'm just kind of rushing through these really quickly just to kind of give you guys an idea of some of the shots that I like to make. Uh, this is in Hawaii, one of my favorite places. Uh, this is at the Wedge uh, Newport. Uh, it's not far from where I live, so I'm at this spot quite often. <laughs> and um, so a couple of the things we're going to be talking about today are panoramas. So this is just basically one of the big differences between shooting a panorama of a drone versus a regular camera is the overlap. Um, with a camera, generally we do a 30% overlap. With the drone, I do a 50 to a 66% overlap. And the reason for that is because the lens is wider and um, you're going to get a lot more distortion when you change the angle of the lens. So I like to cover all of those bases and you'll get a much better shot. Um, and I shoot these manually. Um, you can also use a portrait mode or um, in the Mavic Pro, which means that the uh, sensor actually rotates 90 degrees and you can shoot. It's the only drone that can actually shoot in portrait mode. Um, and then also using panorama mode, I use the grids on the screen. I know I'm rushing through this because I really want to focus on the uh, processing part, but I'll turn on the grids and I can use those to align it. So when I'm shooting a panorama, I know exactly where my previous shot was. And uh, some of the newer drones, the DJI ones, have the pano modes here where we can shoot uh, spheres and, uh, and different types of panoramas where they will actually move the camera and the drone will actually uh, shoot these. So these are great. Um, and you can actually set it to go into uh, RAW. So you'll shoot everything in a DNG RAW. And a lot of this process is now automated, which is really nice. Most of the time I still do it manually, though, just because... I like to do it that way. The other thing I'm going to be talking about a little bit is HDR, and we're going to do one of those. And uh, bracketing. Um, the cameras and the drones are definitely getting better, but they don't have the uh, dynamic range yet of some of your you know, high-end uh, cameras, although they're getting very, very close, uh, particularly with the House of Blood. And, uh, and if you're using something like the Inspire, you will get that kind of dynamic range now. Um, but I like to bracket because a lot of the time you're dealing with a bright sky and a dark foreground. So you've got an incredible amount of dynamic range in a lot of the shots, particularly if you're shooting sunrise or sunset. And a lot of the time I'm shooting directly into the sun. So it's very bright at the top, very dark at the bottom. So I like to bracket those. So I choose AEB and I choose five. And this is the settings there. I would like to use three, but uh, you can't adjust the amount of bracket. It's only 0.7 of a stop. So I will shoot five and uh, usually keep one, three, and five, and then throw away um, 
the two and four, and then uh, that way I can get a good, uh, you know, a good bracket of the of the light, and then I can put that together either either doing exposure blending or doing HDR. And that's it. Thanks for watching. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so what I'm going to do right now is if you know if you want to follow me on the social medias, all that stuff, it's here. We're going to jump into the on one photo raw right now. So let me go here. We're going to launch it. So we're going to use on one photo raw 2019. And I'm going to click on browse. All right. So why don't we start with HDR? So I'm just going to click on here. And here's a folder with three of the shots. Like I told you, I threw away two of them. And this is the brightest shot, which captures a little bit of the detail here in the ground. So we can see that these uh, outriggers are there, but notice the sky is completely blown out. So the other bracket here captures the detail in the sky, in the clouds. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna select these three images. Notice that they're DNG raw files. So everything I'm using today are full size raw files directly out of the camera. So what we wanna do is we want to choose HDR. Oh, what's happening here? This is not the way it's supposed to work. Okay, this worked. Of course this worked when I tested it. Um, and uh, it doesn't wanna merge my HDRs right now. Okay, that's very strange. Okay, don't worry about that. We will try it a different way. I'll do exposure blending right now. So I don't know, it's just a little glitch on my computer right now, apparently. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to grab this one here and we're just going to choose edit. And we're going to open this up right now. And what this is doing is this is a great way to kind of show the uh, sky and everything like that. So what I want to do now is I want to add a uh, new layer in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up under layer and I'm going to add a layer from file. And if I click here on add layer, it'll take me here. I'm going to take the brightest one and click here to add as layer. So what I've got now is I have two layers, one on top of the other one. See that? And then what we want to do is I want to use the sky from this darker image and then on the bottom one here, um, that's, that's using the sky. Then on the top one, I want to use the foreground here with the um, outriggers. So as you can see, this is very, very typical of your drone shot because you're up higher. You're, you're not really, um, you know, uh, working in a single amount of lighting. You're always working in a mixed light because of the altitude. There's no obstructions. Um, so you're usually always dealing with exposing for the sky to get the sky bright enough. The foreground is always dark, particularly this time of the day. And then the other thing here is, of course, if we are exposing for the foreground, the sky is blown out and we're losing the detail. And also a lot of the time with these drone shots, the sky is where the beauty is with these beautiful clouds. So, you know, when I go out and shoot, you know, I, I shoot a lot uh, with my drone and I basically only shoot during magic hour and blue hour, unless it's something like a motor racing event or, or a wedding or some kind of an event like that, that I'm covering. Otherwise I'm only shooting when the light's good. And the other thing I do, I'd live close to the beach. I look out the window. If there's no clouds, I don't even bother going out because it's just not even going to be an interesting uh, sky without the clouds. So, so those clouds really are a big part of this. So let's have a look at going ahead and just kind of, blending these two together. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to go to our local tool. And then I want to go to the gradient. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it to the linear. Uh, let's do the linear top and I'm going to click and drag. And notice what happens immediately. See what we're doing? We're able to set this gradient now. And then what that's doing is this is going between the two photographs. So it's showing the sky from one photograph and it's showing the bottom from the other one. See that? So we can see it's darker there. There's the brighter photo. There's the darker photo. So I'm just going to put the middle point right in there where it's going to blend between the two. And now I can choose to make it more gradual or I can make it very abrupt. In this case, I'd like to make it a little more gradual, but I'm even going to bring it down a little bit because I don't want to lose all of that in the sun. Oops, did not mean to add a second one. 
and we're just going to add that up there. Nice. Okay, so what we want to do now is um, go back to our develop. Actually, I did that on the local. I'm sorry, I did not mean to do that. <laughs> Let me go back on a develop and do it again. Hang on. Grab my local tool. Grab my gradient. And we're going to do the linear top. And of course, I'm on the wrong layer. Sorry, guys. There we go. That's better. Much better. OK, that's more like what it should look like. So there we go. Now we can see that we're blending the bright part here from the top layer and the uh, brighter part down there. So let's go in and adjust these layers now. We want them to match, so we don't want them to look you know, too weird. So um, let's go in the bottom layer here, and I'm gonna play around with the exposure here. So I don't want it completely dark. Notice what I'm doing here is I'm keeping the details. I'm gonna recover our highlights, and I wanna give this one a little bit more contrast. Let's brighten up the midtones a little bit open up our shadow slightly. Now let's push the blacks down and give a little bit of white there. Not too much, but just where it's just kind of looking nice. So now see what we've got. We've got a better sky now and it's just kind of matching. It's blending better. So it's really important that you want to do that. And then we're going to go up to our top layer here. And what we could do is play around with this a little bit. So we could recover our highlights a little. We could definitely open up our midtones just to show a little more detail and I'm going to pull the blacks down to give it some contrast. And you can see what we've done there, you know, just very quickly and easily without spending a lot of time, you know, just able to kind of start to balance the exposure a little bit and, uh, and get something a little bit more uh, useful, like bringing out more of the dynamic range. See, now we've got the clouds, we've got all our details in there, it's not blown out, and we can also see our uh, boats down there in the bottom. So um, this is this is one technique I love to use a lot is this kind of exposure blending. And then, you know, you can always go in and do other things later on, you know, such as, you know, vignettes and different types of effects and things like that to just kind of dress it up, which we'll get to in, uh, in a little bit in some of the other tutorials. So let's just go back here now. I'm going to go back to the browse. And it's just saving it out really quickly. All right, so what I want to do here is we're going to do a panorama. And I'm just going to double click on this folder here. Now, I'm going to select these images. I'm just holding down the shift key and selecting them all. And I'm going to click on pano. And uh, we're just loading up the images right now. And it's going to take a minute because these are full size DNGs. These are 20, these are shot from the Phantom 4 Pro. So these are 20 megapixel raw files each. So we've got a lot of information going in there. All right, so essentially, this is giving us a little preview here of what our panorama is going to look like. So this is one of the things I love about the drone is, you know, that I can get out there and I can just find, you know, the sweet spot, which I think is here between these two buildings. This is Waikiki Beach, by the way, in uh, case you were wondering, in Oahu, Hawaii. And I shot this actually just a couple of months ago. And so I'm actually positioning it here in between these two buildings. I want these buildings the same height and I want them as the center point of the photograph. So one of the great things you can do, it, I, I'm standing over here somewhere and I'm still able to do this because what I can do is slide the drone sideways. And that's one of the things I really recommend you do is find your center point of the photo and then you wanna maneuver by sliding sideways because it really changes the parallax and it changes the perspective of the image. So you're looking for that. And look at the outline. If you look here, there's a silhouette here. And this is, once again, this is not an accident. This is on purpose. And one of the strong um, things you can do is adjust with altitude. So I'm coming down quite low. And by coming down low, what it enables it to do is to create this strong silhouette. If you're up higher, you would actually just see the silhouette of the mountains in the background. And these buildings don't protrude. They're going to be kind of just blending in. So I know a lot of people, they just put the drone as high as they can or, um, and don't really think about 
one of the most important compositional tools and that is altitude. So your silhouette is super, super important. And then also, you know, I'm able to get some of these interesting foreground elements. Um, so you just want to spend a little time doing that. And then when you shoot, what you're going to do is you're going to just take it from the left. You're going to capture your shot and then just rotate, capturing each shot, rotating a little bit and wait a couple of seconds for it to stabilize. Take the shot, rotate a little bit, wait and rotate. And the reason I say that is because right here, it can get a little windy when you get offshore here. And um, the drones use a lot of uh, GPS. They use GLONASS and they also use a GPS system. So it's not unusual to have 22 to 24 satellites locking on to hold its position. So what happens if a little breeze blows it away, you know, if it gets a little strong and blows it off course, the drone will return to that spot, which is why I always give it a couple of seconds to just kind of stabilize before I take the next shot. And in that way, you're, you've got something as stable as a tripod, you know, and some people call it the tripod in the sky. All right, so let's look at the options here. Under type, I'm just using auto. Uh, there's different options that you can use here, but auto seems to work quite well. And this is actually uh, just using spherical. And, um, you know, I'm doing my file size at 100%. But here's one of the things I do want to talk about is the edges. So if we turn none, notice what's happening here. You can see those are the edges around there where I've shot the photograph. And the way it stitches, it kind of stitches in a, a hemispherical kind of a way where you kind of see it. it's like taking a globe and it's unwrapped. So, you know, we definitely want to get rid of that. And there's two ways to do it. One of them is to just crop. And if we do that, what, notice what it's doing is just cropping it to get rid of that transparency. And then there's a second option, which is warp to fill. Now, let me go back here. If you look at the very top part of the image, notice the edges of those clouds here. And notice these people are just going into the picture. If I warp to fill, notice that those are still there. If I crop, those are gone. So basically warp to fill, what it's doing is it's literally just stretching all the pixels out. Just like a, you know, when you would print on silly putty or a piece of gum and stretch it out to fit a particular shape. And that's what it's doing. It's literally stretching out those pixels. So when would you want to crop and when would you want to uh, warp to fill? Okay, so if we look at this, cropping is giving me a more pleasing result. The horizon is more level. In this case, you know, we might have to do some straightening. But here's the thing. If there's nothing important around these edges and we're not losing anything, then we're going to choose crop. In fact, I prefer it because with warp, notice what's happening. We've got little, you know, half of certain objects around here and we're not losing anything. There's no important detail on the edges. So I would use crop in that situation. If there's important detail and you need to keep more of the photograph in there, then use the warp option. And then we're just going to hit it there. And then we're just going to hit save. And then when we do that, then what happens is uh, Photo Raw is now going to build the stitch. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hit cancel. And uh, the reason for that is I just did it. Like five minutes before this, I literally uh, went in here and I stitched it. And this is the stitch. And the reason I'm doing it this way is just to save a little bit of time. So we're just going to go into edit because it takes a moment. Because remember, these are full resolution files that we're working with. Um, these are very, very large files and, and raw files at that. So right now you can see we're only 8%. So this is a really, really huge image. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to just hide my presets so we can see this a little bit better. And you can see the panorama is actually stitched really well. I'm not really seeing any issues with any seams or anything like that. It's looking really good. Now, if you do get seams, they're quite easy to fix. Um, all we need to do is just go to our refine tools here. Uh, not our refine, sorry. We want to go to our uh, fix tools. And then what I like to do is either use the brush here the, or the clone stamp. And uh, actually, sometimes the clone stamp works the best. And then what I'll do is I'll take it to a very, very high feather. I'll turn it all the way up. And then I'll bring the opacity down quite low, maybe even as low as 10%. 
And then if you do get seams, then you can just brush in here over those seams. But the other thing I like to do is, um, you know, you can turn on pen pressure if you want to do that as well. That's another option. Um, so then that way, if you want to do fine areas, you just push very lightly. If you want to spread it and cover larger areas, you can push harder. And this makes it easy, you know, for doing things like when we get close to clouds and things like that, we're going to use a lighter touch than when we're uh, in the larger areas. And then by working at a low opacity, you can just kind of blend that in. If there's any areas there that didn't uh, stitch well, you know, if there was any kind of a seam happening, which can definitely happen if you don't um, use exposure locks. So when you're shooting your uh, panoramas and you're using auto exposure, well, obviously when you face towards the sun here, you're gonna get a very different exposure than when you're going over here. Uh, pointing away from the sun. And remember, when you're working on a panorama like this, you know, we could be 180 degrees away from the sun. So literally, we could be front lit on one shot and back lit on another shot. So, you know, if you do that, then you might get some seams in there that need to be smoothened out. So at this point here, all I would do is just some basic adjustments. I don't think this needs a whole ton of work in here, but let's go make sure we're in the develop here. And uh, one of the things I want to do is I just want to recover my highlights a little bit just to kind of keep my sky looking nice, keeping my clouds looking good. So I'm not clipping those. And if you don't have this turned on, just click on there and make sure you can see your histogram. And uh, obviously this is the black here. If it touches the end, then we're using the full dynamic range. If we're not touching the end here, then that means we don't have any true blacks in the image. And if this has been cut off, it's too dark. And same here with the highlights. So I'm recovering the highlights and I'm going to play around with the shadows. I'm going to open those up just a little bit. Not like that. See when it goes too far, it's so easy to go too far and it, it just doesn't look good. So be very careful with the shadows. I think you can get away with being quite aggressive recovering highlights, but always be mindful when you're recovering shadows that you can very, very quickly make your image look fake by going uh, too far. Notice I've only got it to three. I don't like to move that one too much. However, one adjustment I really do like is the midtones, and uh, and I'm going to be using that a little bit. So right now it's still looking a little too bright, but that's okay. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to take out blacks and we're going to push those down to kind of crush those a little bit. And I'm just watching the histogram up there. And same with the whites. This just not go too far, but we just want to clean our whites a little bit. And what this does, um, you know, versus um, highlights, highlights recover our detail that gets lost sometimes in, uh, you know, in some of these brighter areas. And the whites, what they do is they just clean them. So if they start to look too milky, it just kind of brings back some of that definition. Now, at this point here, I might take my overall exposure and possibly even pull that back a little bit. So I'm just easing it back into... Uh, you know, where my midtones are looking good and we're getting some good detail. Another thing I like to do often is play around with the temperature and maybe warm it up just a little bit. Not a lot, but just a touch. And it's just kind of giving us that nice, um, you know, we're around the sunset. So we definitely want to, you know, enhance that a little bit. Not too much. Don't take it like that, but just give it just a little bit where we're just starting to just give it a little warmth. And then if we kind of look at this before and after, you can see I didn't do a whole ton to this. Um, I might push up the vibrance a touch, not a lot, but just a little bit. Um, and that just kind of enhances the water, makes it look kind of nice. And, uh, you know, basically, you know, I'm not gonna do a lot more to this because I wanna keep this one looking very realistic. Um, so some of the things I like to do, though, is I do like to do localized adjustments, and we're actually going to do that um, in the next example. Um, so a lot of the time, you know, some of my signature work is, you know, I'd like to shoot a big panorama and then go in, you know, adjust my settings just like you see right now, get the adjustments good, maybe do a little exposure blending. Um, you know, if I was doing this, you know, taking my time on it, I might have another exposure here, just like the previous tutorial that I showed you. And I might drop in an underexposed part there and blend that in a little bit. That's why I always shoot with multiple exposures. So even when I'm shooting my panoramas, 
I'm also setting it to multiple exposures and I'm shooting those five shots um, as I'm rotating it. So then that gives me the dynamic range that I need if I need to recover some details. And all you need to do is just drop that one photo in uh, just exactly like I showed you before. Um, and you would just do that and then you could just kind of blend them that way if you need to recover dynamic range uh, in the photos. Now, one thing to be aware of is when you're shooting these panoramas and you're doing exposure bracketing, um, you have to be um, very patient because it can take a little bit of time. Um, you'll see a little spinning uh, wheel, a little blue wheel will spin. You don't want to take the next shot until that's finished or you could end up missing some shots. Uh, another tip is get the fastest card that your uh, drone supports. Um, and a lot of them support the ultra high speed two cards. Um, check, check your specs, get the fastest card because it really does make a huge difference when you're doing these multiple shots. Um, it can cut your processing down, uh, your shooting time down by you know a half or even more. All right, so let's go down. We're just gonna click on a browse again and uh, we're gonna move into something a little bit different. What I wanna do here is I wanna grab this shot here and we're just gonna open this right now. Okay, so this shot is very flat. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, we have a setting on there, you know, where we can shoot on a log and we can shoot flat. If you're shooting in raw, it doesn't matter because you can adjust those settings later. If you're shooting to a JPEG uh, for some reason, then you wanna use that log and get a flatter image like this. And the reason we want to shoot flat is because it holds more dynamic range. Now we need to give this a little bit of punch and, uh, and we're going to do that. So what we're going to do here, and this is really going to be, we're going to focus the rest of our time on this particular example is I'm going to show you how I do my local adjustments. First of all, we're going to do some basic adjustments, just overall global adjustments and then we're going to go in and i'm going to show you how i like to do dodging and burning not just to bring out detail and uh, recover the dynamic range but also to give this a three-dimensionality because this is looking flat and a lot of that also has to do with the time of day that i'm shooting it's not a bad time of the day obviously you can tell there but just the angle you know we don't have a lot of contrast there but we're going to add that and really make this, uh, you know, just pop off the page. And it's one of the things I do on most of my photographs. Okay, so let's have a look at adjusting it. We can see here, there's the, you know, it's pushed a little bit into the highlights. You can see that by the histogram. So we definitely want to pull that down a little bit. There we go. And I want to give it some blacks, just give it a little bit more body. And I'm going to give these midtones a little boost. So it might be looking a little washed out in those midtones right now, but that's good because the dodging and burning is going to enable us to really bring back what we want here. Now I could give this a little bit of structure and I will, I'm just going to give it a touch though. Just seven is enough. Once again, this is another one of those sliders that can, you can really get carried away with. You know, if you pull this too high, notice what's happening is bringing in a lot of detail, a lot of contrast here, mid-tone contrast. But what it's also doing is it's blowing out a lot of the dynamic range and it's giving it that kind of sketched effect, you know, um, kind of a little more grungy. And I just feel like, you know, that's something everybody did a, a few years ago, but it's that particular look, in my opinion, is becoming a little passe. So I'm gonna pull it up, not so high. I wanna re recover the detail. I wanna keep the detail in the photograph and and if we want to give it some punch we will come back and we'll give it some punch in a little bit so what i want to do now though is i want to work locally and we're going to paint this in and it's going to give it a really cool kind of a, a painterly look so what we're going to do is click on local and then what we want to do now is we want to work on dodging and burning now dodging and burning as you all know comes from the dark room and the first thing we're going to do is burning so notice if I change this, nothing's happening. And that's because my mask is inverted. So let me just click on here and just click on invert. And now we see the mask is now showing white. So if you're not seeing what's going on, that's why. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna kind of darken this down a little bit. 
this is going to be for our shadows. So I'm going to turn the exposure down a little bit. I'm going to turn the blacks down a little bit. So I'm looking for some, some body, even slightly crushing them. I'm going to leave the midtones alone. I'm definitely going to recover these highlights. And I think that's looking pretty good. Why don't I even like just block up the shadows a little bit and possibly even pull down the mids? All right, so this is going to essentially be our burning. This is what we're going to use to add shadow and darken. In fact, I'm going to go even darker. Push the blacks down a little bit more, pull the exposure down. And, you know, if it's too much, the great thing is, you know, I can always go back and I can adjust this later. So now what I want to do is I want to invert it. And by inverting it, what I'm doing is I'm hiding that effect. So the effect is there. And all I need to do is I just need to paint it on. But I'm just going to click there right now. And I want to add a second adjustment. And I'm going to click in here. I'm going to invert it once again so we can see what's going. And this is going to be our dodging or brightening. So I'm going to open it up, make it brighter. And this is where we're going to paint with the light. We're going to create sunlight. So we're going to go and do that. Maybe um, definitely want to recover these highlights a little bit because we don't want to lose the highlights when we brighten this. So just be wary of that, that you don't blow it out by going too far. Definitely want to open up our midtones a little bit and give the whites just a touch, but not too much. Let's recover these highlights to compensate. And then we're going to give it just a slight little bit of warmth. And then what this is going to do is it's going to simulate sunlight hitting on there. So once again, we're going to invert this to hide it. And we're going to click. Now, what I want to do is I want to go back to this one. And let's just call this one burn, just so I know which is which. And there's one thing I want to invert this. There's one thing I forgot to do, which is just a nice touch. And that's to cool it down a little bit. So if we go into the temperature and we just push it a little bit there, now it becomes a little bit more blue. Very, very subtle move. But what it does is it just adds a little more natural color. So we're pushing the blues into the shadows and the sunlight into those highlights. So let's invert it again so we can hide it. And now what we want to do is we want to paint. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over here and we're going to choose local. And uh, I don't know why I clicked on faces. <laughs> I meant to click on the local. Let's go back there. So there we are on our local. And what I'm going to do, just pull this down for a little second because there's uh, the webinar interface is in the way there. Whoa, let me just get back into the on one row. There we go. And then what we want to do is we want to paint this in. And I want to keep the feather around 50 is good. And let's take our opacity down quite a bit. I'm going to take it down to about 30 because I want to paint this subtle. I don't want to be painting it in really hard. And then the other thing here is pressure adjust size and opacity. So I'm using a Wacom right now. I'm on a Wacom Cintiq. So um, what I want to do is I want to turn off size and I want the pressure to only affect the opacity. So that means that as I paint harder, I can kind of shape that light, kind of like sketching. Now I'm making the brush smaller by hitting the left bracket key. Now I'm just going to do this quickly just to kind of show you guys, you know, essentially how this would work. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the light direction. You can see which direction the light's coming from based on the shadows there. So you can see there's the shadows, there's the highlights. And so we want to kind of respect that and realize that these parts that protrude out here are going to capture the light, which means the other parts are going to go into shadow. And by doing this, what it's going to do is I'm just going to start painting quickly. And I'm not going to spend as much time on this as I normally would. So forgive me if I'm getting a little rough. But what it's doing is it's creating separation between the different subjects. Now, it's not going to show a ton while I'm on the shadows. Of course, if I show you before and after, you'll be surprised how quickly this can build up. But I'm going to just lay down the shadows a little bit first. But where the magic really happens is when I add the highlights. But see what I'm doing? I'm just separating these clusters. And then what it's doing is it's creating a separation in this image, which is really going to make it pop. It's going to simplify the image. It's going to help lead the eye around the image, um, especially, you know, things like edges. You know, we like to always burn these edges a little bit. 
And so what I'm doing is I'm just kind of quickly doing this. And I might even do just a little touch on the beach here just to kind of fake a little bit of a, a hump here on the sand so you can see how this is really working. And this will really show you how it works. So I'm just touching these areas here. Now I would take my time going close and I would just generally get into every single one of these little areas here. Um, and you can just get an incredible result. Now we don't have the time to do that, but see how I can go in as I do this, see how I'm starting to separate these areas. So before it just looked like one form. Now I can start to uh, really just chisel out the image, I guess is the word I'd like to use. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into our dodging and now watch what happens here. This is just where the magic starts to happen. So now look at this, the sunlight is just starting to hit the top here. And we can just see here, we're just kissing the top of these with sunlight. And uh, same here. And I'm going to go down onto this and just kind of just touch it a little bit. And notice as we're doing this, see how it starts to separate this. So now this looks like it's coming forward. I would drop a little more shadow in there normally. Um, and you can just see what's happening now is we're getting that separation between different parts of the image. And it gives it a three dimensional look. And you can just kind of see there, let me make that a little bigger, maybe a little sunlight just kind of hitting out there. And I would put a shadow and if I want to do the shadow, I just grab that shadow quick a little bit. Let's just do this for now. Because I'm noticing we don't have a whole ton of time. Okay, so I'm just going down here, just building that up. And then if I go on the beach here, and I wanted to kind of blend that in, see how the lights just kind of coming in here just kissing the tops of these parts. And, you know, we could even kind of just start to bathe it in a little sunlight around here. And so you can actually redirect, redirect the light. So make it look, you know, like the sun's actually coming in here. And then we could drop in shadow, you know, we could start to paint that in and see how now it just sort of makes, makes it look now there's a little ledge, see how it gives it that dimensionality. So the image is not looking so flat anymore. In fact, why don't we go down here and I'm just going to grab the burning again really quickly. And I'm just going to grab the backside of this. And maybe just go in here into the shadow a little bit. And you can see, you know, what we're doing there. Obviously, you know, when I'm doing this for real, I'll zoom in close to take a little bit more time on it. But I just want to kind of show you guys. And maybe on these edges, you know, we could start to get a, just a little shadow in there just to kind of cut that. Because this area could be in shadow being, you know, as the sun's coming in and see how it starts to separate these areas here. So, um, so essentially, you know, that's what we're doing there with the dodging and burning. Let me pull this up. And to show you how much has happened, let me show you. Let's turn that burning off. In fact, why don't we just collapse that? And there we go. So there's the burning on and off. And let's look at the dodging. And so there's our dodging. Oh. And what I'm going to do, turn that opacity up, make sure it doesn't get turned off. There we go. So that's before and after, and you can see how it's really starting to add that light. Now, the great thing is we can always come back here later on. And if we wanted to make it even brighter, you know, we can do that, you know, so you have that option to go back and change it later. So we're just kind of laying down our dimension. And now the next step is coming and kind of refine it, maybe make that sun a little bit warmer. You know, I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit here, just so you guys can really see it. And then what I might do is take the opacity. I take the opacity all the way down. And then what I'm doing is I'm looking at the image for a couple of seconds and I'm calibrating my eye to the unadjusted image. So now as I just start to bring it back in, I can see how that affects it. And I can stop there. And by going this way and going from nothing and bringing it up, it enables me to be more subtle. 
if you start at 100 and then back it off, you're always going to end up higher because your eye is used to the adjusted image. And, um, and then that's why sometimes you make your adjustments, you go away and you come back. And then it seems like, oh man, these look really over adjusted. Uh, you know, when it looks over processed. And so, you know, you always want to sit on your image for a little, for a minute, you know, so that you're um, not, uh, you know, making your, uh, sorry, I, I like to, you know, work on the image, go away, you know, and then come back and then look at it with fresh eyes. So you never really want to, you know, just call it a wrap in one go. You always want to look at it again, um, you know, later on. And so we're going back here and now we can make some more overall adjustments if we wanted to add a little bit more contrast or we wanted to kind of, you know, play around with this, you know, maybe wanted to give it a little bit more vibrance, you know, just make it punch a little bit. So what I'm doing now is I'm going back and I'm doing my overall adjustments and maybe I want to warm the whole image up or cool it down. Um, and the nice thing is all of this is just going to kind of move together. And then if we look at it, you know, here is our image before and there's our image afterwards. And we can see that, you know, we can really see, um, you know, a big difference there by using the dodging and burning. So one of the things I love to do is when I make my adjustments to these uh, photographs, you know, where I'm shooting HDR or I'm doing panorama or any kind of image, I'd like to come back and do this kind of a process at the end, just to kind of customize it. And the nice thing about it too, is if you, if you use a very soft brush and, uh, and a large feather, you can create a really nice soft painterly look that doesn't look like everything else that, uh, you know, people are used to, you know, you, you can add your own personality and your own individuality into the shot by the way you process it, the way you see the shadow, the way you see the light. Now, it might take a little bit of practice, like, you know, I do have a little bit of a background in fine art, which is why, you know, it's, I kind of understand how the light is hitting. And I would recommend if you want to be a great um, retoucher or great at processing, take some fine art classes as well, because learning how to sketch and draw can actually translate and help you a lot in your photography as well. So anyway, I think um, we want to have a look and see if we can do, we've got any questions or anything like that, because I know we're close to being up with our time. Yeah, there's uh, no questions in our uh, conference right now, but there, uh, there is someone asking, uh, what tablet were you using for your editing? Uh, the one I'm using right now is a Wacom Cintiq 22 inch. Um, so it's a screen uh, that you draw onto the screen with the pen. Uh, but I also have the Intuos uh, Pro Medium, which I use, you know, when I'm traveling. Um, so, you know, the on-screen stuff is definitely great when it comes to dodging and burning, but you can get exactly the same result by using the tablet on the table. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, yeah, there's no other questions that I can see here. So uh, if you have any final parting words for us, Colin, now would be the time. Well, I guess uh, just uh, follow me on social media because um, I do post a picture every day on Instagram. Um, so if you guys do like my aerial photography, please follow me on Instagram at Photoshop Cafe. Um, and then also if you like the drone stuff and, uh, you know, on my YouTube channel, I do a lot of tutorials, but I also do drone tutorials um, as well as like tech reviews and things like that. But anyway, guys, thanks for, uh, you know, for having me here. I really appreciate your time. I hope uh, that these techniques are, you know, things that you can apply to your own workflow. Now, I would never say use the settings that I use or necessarily use my workflow. You know, what you want to do is learn from instructors like myself and other people and take pieces that are going to help you and build your own workflow and develop your own style. So, you know, I, I'm all about, you know, hey, you know, you watch some things you might be like, hey, I really like that. I didn't like that. Well, that's fine. Grab the stuff you like make it your own and uh, and make beautiful art. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, Colin, for being here today. Uh, just to, to remind everyone, this will be posted on our YouTube, on our blog right afterwards. So thank you guys for joining us here today. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and close the meeting now, everyone. Colin, thank you so much for being here with us today. All right, thanks for having me. Yep, cheers. <laughs>